Um, thanks so very much. <laughs> You're too kind. Thanks for the kind invitation. And thanks for setting up this wonderful conference. So in this short, in this short talk, we will be concerned with a topic that's sometimes um, dismissed, seen as a detail or rather as an engineering task, but it is not, which is how can we find out at the end of the day when we aim at doing something in the quantum technologies, whether we've actually done the right thing and how we can exploit randomness in benchmarking beyond randomized benchmarking. So we live in exciting times, so much is for sure. Um, so while the idea of a quantum computer is not entirely new, we've already Richard Feynman was talking about them in the, in the 80s. Only in recent years, quantum computers are being built to a reasonable scale. So they're surely still pretty noisy and, and rather small. But to be fair, the devices we have today seemed quite inconceivable not very long ago. And equipped with them, we can think of, say, variational quantum algorithms. And we've thought about them quite a bit recently. Machine learning problems. Actually, I talked about that not long ago. So that's why I, I changed the topic or um, paradigmatic problems. So in fact, for such problems, a, a quantum advantage has presumably been found by beautiful work by the Google team, by Pan Chan Wai here in China, and also others. But again, how can we find out whether we have done the right thing? For the quantum advantage scheme, this is particularly intricate, tricky, and also somewhat ironic, asking about this. We just put out a RMP on it, feedback is most welcome. So in fact, even uh, uh, optimally reading out the Hamiltonian in variational quantum circuits is not obvious at all. <laughs> then similar questions arise for quantum simulators, as we just heard from the beautiful talk before, that have been around for longer. So in analog simulation, you can think of probing time evolution, ground state properties, and people get very excited about programmable quantum stimulators. But again, the same question arises. So um, operating a quantum chip requires a detailed knowledge of the functioning. And acquiring such knowledge, however, becomes exceedingly demanding as quantum processors are being scaled up. So at the end of the day, how can we benchmark and read out quantum devices. And this is what we focus on in this talk. So the answer is, um, well, <laughs> it depends. We just put out a long a review not so long ago that um, classifies possible schemes of benchmarking and tomography um, based on the, on the assumptions one is willing to make on, on, on the one axis and the information one is aiming to acquire on the other axis. Again, this being a short talk, I thought it would be a good idea to give two elements of hopefully not too patronizing advice. The first thing is Hilbert space is large, it's huge. Exploit structure if you, if you can. So let me give an example from variational quantum algorithms where you have to measure the Hamiltonian at the end of the day. So when you measure the energy expectation, say, of this simple easing Hamiltonian, back just what we saw in the previous talk, what you can do is you can really measure out term by term, and then you will need of the order n over epsilon squared many measurements where the 1 over epsilon squared would come from the familiar shifting bound. That's great. But knowing this specific Hamiltonian, you can do better by just measuring one Pauli word, x to the power of n, and then marginalizing where you get all in one shot, and then you get away with one over epsilon squared many measurements. But um, so then you are exploiting structure because you, you know what you aim for, and you, you, compute, or you measure only a couple of, of, of terms. But there's lots of structures that are around that are interesting and meaningful, say, in state tomography, you're mostly interested in states that are, say, pure, or close to being pure, or low rank. And 
we've been thinking a lot about low rank quantum state tomography over the years with a lot of mathematical framework being set up, but we've also joined forces with our friends in Innsbruck to recover the state of a seven trap ion system. The upshot is if you know that the state is low rank or, or pure, then you can do much better than for naive settings. Again, exploit structure if you, if you can. But to come back to our problem of variational circuits, um, so we have this very specific Hamiltonian, right? That's a very simple one. But if you don't have that, then what do you do? Well, you can do better. In fact, you can just measure of the order log n many random Paulis, not n. Just measure whatever you can, and then you get away with it and can with high probability indeed recover the expectation. So the second advice is exploit randomness if you can. It's an extremely powerful tool. This again comes in in many forms and flavors. Um, I think some years ago, we even introduced the idea of using random circuits um, in efficient estimation techniques of many properties of quantum many body systems that then um, turned or inspired ideas on shadow estimation and what is now called the randomized measurement toolbox. This paper was maybe written 10 years too early, but now it's kind of um, catching on, which is nice to see. The upshot of these ideas is that you can do random circuits and random measurements and estimate lots of properties of many body systems in an efficient way that seems out of scope if you think naively of quantum state tomography. Again, exploit randomness whenever you can. Which brings me to the main technical part of this talk on random measurements beyond randomized benchmark. So again, that sounds a bit <laughs> um, like a phrase, but it's surely true that the success of the quantum technologies demands a precise characterization and control of quantum devices. Let this be in digital computing, quantum simulation, and so on. So how can we, based on data, which is all we have at the end of the day, find out whether the components have worked as anticipated? Now, in the digital world of quantum computing, in the world of Rigetti's, Google's, and, and, and IBM's, uh, the bread and butter way of understanding like diagnostic information about quantum gate sets is so-called randomized benchmarking, which delivers information about the so-called average gate fidelity. It's an ingenious scheme of preparing states and then applying a sequence of random circuits from a group, say the Clifford group, and then one unders things at the end, which is possible because it's a group, and then performs measurement, and one might do this for different lengths of the sequence, and from that one can get relevant diagnostic information, in particular the average gate fidelity of the, of the gate sets. And this is nice because it's robust. It's, in fact, state preparation and measurement spam robust, so the, the preparations can be a bit wrong and the measurements can be a bit wrong, but one can still reliably estimate the quality of the quantum gates, which is a must if one wants to be practical and feasible in experiments. So this is a wonderful idea. Um, it's not entirely new. There was a first protocol dating back to 2008 where all building blocks were already there, but no theoretical justification. But to be fair, it's a, it's a proper benchmarking protocol even applied to a nice Eintracht experimental setting. Then there was first theoretical work that was abstract, um, that had already some ideas in it on randomized benchmarking based on high averages. It's beautiful work, but again, high averages cannot be efficiently implemented. So that was a bit um, like abstract if you want. And that was soon unified into the, the plain vanilla, the, the Volkswagen of the randomized benchmarking schemes on Clifford averages, which is now much um, used in labs the world over, including China for that matter. But that's not it. I mean, it's not the only scheme uh, by no means. There's real randomized benchmarking. There is dihedral randomized benchmarking based on the dihedral group. There's monomial randomized benchmarking, denote dihedral randomized benchmarking, complete randomized benchmarking, linear cross-entropy benchmarking, 
your head explodes. To my understanding, there's no fewer than 34 different schemes of randomized benchmarking, which is great. But then um, there seems to be not a full consensus of what it all means, what's the best scheme to be applied when there's meetings, there's lots of discussions and a bit of shouting on the precise interpretation of, of things. So that motivated us to think more deeply whether one could find a unifying framework of randomized benchmarking in one way or the other. So this is well motivated in several ways. First, we wanted to kind of see how these 34 different randomized benchmarking schemes could be like, like phrased in, 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 one, in one framework to also resolve the serious confusion about the precise interpretation of the data, what it means to diagnostic information about the gate sets. We also wanted to have a sound mathematical basis and have like theorems and rigorous recovery guarantees, both for the quantum and the classical post-processing parts, because let's not forget here in this field, being precise and rigorous about things and having guarantees is bread and butter because it's all about precision and finding out stuff from data. And what is more, we want to see whether we can find a basis for new schemes altogether in one way or the other. Now, what is a randomized benchmarking scheme? What are all randomized benchmarking schemes? Well, in some way, there will be a group in the center, the Clifford group or any other group acting on um, NQBIT. There must be a notion of idealness that's the reference representation, that's the representation of the group into the physical system as an ideal implementation in terms of gates and gate sets. There's a POVM capturing the measurement. There's an initial state that you feed in. You can do an inverse gate, this being a group, but in principle, you can in, on, top of have, in, on top of that have an end gate that often may be the identity, but it doesn't have to be, and then a set of sequence lengths of the, the protocol. That's the input. Now there's real life, the, the reality, the harsh reality of the lab, if you want, that's provided by the quantum device, which we call the implementation map that takes the abstract group and implements this in the actual, possibly imperfect, or surely imperfect device as the representation of this map in the physical machine that's operating these imperfect quantum gates. And at the end, data is all we have, so estimates of probabilities given the respective input from the clicks of the experiment. This is the framework that we have in mind. So there's a folklore claim what this all means, what this delivers, and one says that as long as the implementation map is kind of close to the reference implementation, so the, the dealness is close to, to reality, one should expect that the probabilities should be kind of like linear combinations of certain, in, in a certain way, weighted exponential decays of certain um, numbers. That's great, it makes a lot of sense, but what does close really mean? I mean in, in, in what sense, and is it really true? Is it a sum of exponentials? And this is what we wanted to settle once and for all. So this is a long paper. It was a 60 pages chainsaw massacre. So I have no time to go into the details of the argument, but on the highest level, what we do is we think of convolutions of implementation maps and de deliver a, a convolution picture of randomized benchmarking, if you, if you want. So taking this seriously, one can write the m-fold implementation of, of gates as an m-fold convolution and the whole probability at the end can be written in a linearized fashion where there's an input state and the linearized pubm at the end as an m-fold invocation of this map when we now invoke a Fourier picture but not a standard Fourier picture but one that goes from group elements to channels to super operators where the frequency modes are given by the irreducible representations of the respective group. And then developing this 
um, somewhat formal picture, one can uh, form formulate an inverse transform and, and think of an convolution property that basically the, the many maps get um, kind of captured by a, a, a product which leads to an exponential decay. And indeed, one finds that putting this all together, there is a mother or father theorem basically that if you consider an RBE with an implementation map and a reference representation, and if you assume that it's kind of like precisely right in a very precise way, namely that the diamond norm given here is smaller than the given constant. And there's also other ways of precise closeness that we present in our paper. Then it is really true that these probabilities can be written as sums of the exponentials, just as the Faulkner claim says, it's true under a technical assumption of non-degeneracy that can be easily checked. Um, in, a, in, in a precise way, but with the right-hand side, with a guarantee, with a recovery guarantee that it can be bounded. And that's not only true for some plain vanilla scheme, but in fact, for all randomized benchmarking schemes, for all groups, all sequences, all settings that we kind of put into the framework, this is the, 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 the formal framework of all possible randomized benchmarking schemes. So that setting encapsulates all known schemes for randomized benchmark, but that's not the only mother and father theorem that we have, but we also have a second one that looks at the classical post-processing and um, which is equally important where we again have a rigorous guarantee so that we can interpret the classical data with error bounds and really say that this is what it means to that um, accuracy and, and confidence. So this is nice, that um, settles the RB picture, but it should be clear that it's also the basis for new schemes. We're just finalizing a paper on analog randomized benchmarking for analog quantum simulators of the type that we just heard in the previous beautiful talk. And so on, there's lots of other ways you can think about things. You also think more generally about new ideas on shadow estimation, and I will say a few more words about this. In fact, based on data of the type, you perform a Clifford circuit, and you do measurements like in RB, you can not only do randomized benchmarking, but you can do a lot more, really a wealth of things based on these simple data. And we ask, can this be made a shadow channel estimation scheme? And the answer is yes, you can take these data, random Cliffords, and you measure, and use this to set up sequence shadows, like classical post-processing schemes, to, for example, to, um, shadow estimation and then do gate set, do um, randomized benchmarking with no end gate or gate set shadow estimation. You can do a full channel tomography, like full recovery of the unknown noise channel that you have in the quantum set. So really no, learn the full noisy thing just with a random Clifford gate set, gate set and measurement. You learn the full noise channel with the same type of data. You can do learning of Pauli channels. You can do crosstalk tomography that estimates the crosstalk between quantum gates, again, with random Cliffords and measurements, with the same type of experimentally friendly data. So we caught our friends in, in Innsbruck, um, Thomas Mons, whether he can take data from random Cliffords and so on. He said, Jens, are you joking? These are data we long have. This is plain vanilla stuff we do every day. So again, you kind of push the misery to the theorists who's then using the same type of feasible data to squeeze different type of diagnostic information out, ranging from full tomography to um, RP with no end gate, crosstalk tomography, and so on, getting a wealth of information based on the same type of data. Again, randomness helps. The same type of data can be used for multiple purposes of quantum systems identification. Now we think of analog randomized benchmarking schemes of bosons and fermions, randomized schemes for estimating higher moments, the upshot is use randomness whenever you can. 19 minutes into the talk, which brings me to the much shorter second part, because I would like to leave some time for questions on notions of Hamiltonian learning, where we say, what is the dynamical law after all? What is the Hamiltonian in the system? And that's not a new question. If you think about this, when Kepler was looking into the sky and was seeing these funny points moving around, it took the genius of Newton to find out what the dynamical laws were, but ultimately there were like learning dynamical laws from data. 
or what is the Hamiltonian? I mean, that's surely important in the quantum technologies when you think of analog simulations and want to be precisely sure what you have in the lab. But even foundationally, fundamentally, it's an important question. Say, I've not given a single time a lecture on classical or quantum mechanics where not some student asked me, yeah, you talk about the Schrodinger equation and that says how to make predictions on outcomes, but what is the Hamiltonian after all? And then I say, oh, it's given, it specifies the system. And the student would say, yeah, but how do we know? I mean, there's no voice speaking to us in the lab what the Hamiltonian is. And if there is, maybe we have another problem. So how can we learn the Hamiltonian from data? That's all we have. And that's a very meaningful question. When we started, this was a bit of a fringe question. Now it's a bit a field in its own right, if you want. So what you do is you kind of think of a class of Hamiltonian models, the concept class that embodies your a priori knowledge that you have about the Hamiltonian, which is reasonable as a promise to the type of problem you have. And then you take, you go to the lab. I mean, not me, <laughs> never let the theorists into the lab, but somebody goes into the lab and performs measurements at snapshots in time up to some tolerance, and then would like to learn the Hamiltonian within this concept class from these data points. We have two approaches here. The first one combines tensor network models and machine learning techniques that came out just a couple of days ago that I'm very happy about, in particular about the theorems we have in the appendix, which is nice and nitty gritty, but the upshot of the method is very simple and very basic, but it works just strangely well in it's very much applicable and practically meaningful as a very simple um, and compelling idea, which is you have a product state, you have your lab data, and you take your product state on a classical computer represented, and you do a time evolution under a Hamiltonian within the concept class using a state-of-the-art tensor network idea, say TBD or something like some tensor network propagation giving rise to a matrix product state at the end of the day where you can compute marginals, you can compute probabilities, you can even efficiently sample from the output distribution, classically efficiently. This will be efficient in space and inefficient in time for the BQP completeness of time evolution, but you can do this for some reasonably long time. And then you, you have that, and then you have your Hamiltonian parameters, you compute the probabilities, and then you compare this with the data and compute in automatic differentiation, the gradient of the max likelihood cost fu loss function as, a, as, a, as, as your cost function. And then you basically use automatic differentiation and stochastic gradient descent methods of basically machine learning methods to basically match the, the data that you measure with the predicted classical data at hand and you learn the parameters along the way. And this may sound simple, but it's working surprisingly well it works well to say learn, well, that's just an example. It would work, work for any local Hamiltonian, say Heisenberg type Hamiltonians from a certain concept class to very good accuracy to very small errors for system sizes in there, easily up to 100. So it's scalable in space with errors that are constant in the system size and um, scale like the inverse square root of the data set of, of, of the data set size of the, of the, of the data set. So that's kind of a sweet spot it's not like a very short evolution that gives rise to bad scaling in the in the like bad sample complexity but not for long times which would be infeasible because it's a, a classically hard problem but it's looking at the sweet spot and you can nicely learn Hamiltonians from data so also a second way where we join forces with our friends at Google AI for an a very simple concept class, namely non-interacting bosons in the presence of noise. But if you really think of a, of a noisy device, the devil is in the detail, and um, it was a really nice joint work where we calibrated the Sycamore Google chip that was also used in the famous quantum advantage experiments where we worked hard to overcome the limitations and understood that there's initial jumps and final ones, and one has to be spam robust to make it work and has to develop techniques for that. Also, what we overcame, and that was the obstacle that, that the Google team had, that one has to be interestingly better than the Shannon resolution limits when doing the Fourier transform and use super resolution techniques to overcome these limits. And only then one can use manifold optimization to 
recover the respective eigenspace. By putting that together, one can do a recovery and can learn the unknown Hamiltonian from data, which is what we did. We learned the, um, we learned the Hamiltonian of the SICAM chip. We really walked the entire chip. We also did some physics on like, spectra of the six qubit half Hamiltonian. But the most important point is that we really walked the full chip and calibrated the chip in its quality, which is very high precision. Um, but it has dark corners and um, better parts. The outcome is actually hilarious. And uh, to our understanding, it's not only the best analog Hamiltonian simulator, but also the best calibrated um, Hamiltonian to sub megahertz precision of an analog simulator of, it, of its time. And this gives rise to a comp compelling situation. And once you've like, really calibrated the chip, you have much better predictive power and you can extremely precisely learn the Hamiltonian, also in the previous method for short times or intermediate times, and then make predictions because you can't classically make the prediction for a long time. That's not, not available, it's a, it's a hard problem. You can learn the Hamiltonian, and at least to the extent you have some trust in the, in, 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 in the physics, then once you have that to very high precision, you can go into the lab and make the prediction for long times and can probe the many body system but based on an extremely precisely calibrated Hamiltonian, which is a nice premise and, 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 and setting. Which brings me to the end of the talk, 26 minutes into the talk. So in this talk, we set out to ask in what way we can benchmark and verify quantum devices. So quantum devices solve practical and paradigmatic problems beyond classical capabilities. But in order to unveil that potential, we have to be really sure that what we think we are doing is actually what we are actually doing in the lab. Otherwise, it's a very expensive way of producing random numbers. In the first part and the bigger part, we understood that randomness is the key. We can think of simple measurements and can exploit the same randomized scheme, random Cliffords and measurements to get a wealth of robust diagnostic information out. You push the misery to the theories and you can use simple data and get a lot of stuff out about your quantum system. In the shorter second part, we thought, good, can we learn the Hamiltonian after all and do precise Hamiltonian identification and verification with the cute premise that once you have this, you have the Hamiltonian precisely verified and calibrated, then you can use this information to go back to your original premise and can again solve paradigmatic problems and practical ones, but now with much more predictive power because you've very highly and precisely calibrated your system so that when you make predictions, you have stronger predictive power. And on that note, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to questions you might possibly have having closed this cycle. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Yes, really nice talk and a very beautiful slices. Uh, <laughs> It's indeed a very, very important question. So how could we uh, really know the power and uh, whether we have, you know, reached to the expected results of uh, the quantum devices?